Hello, Homeworthy, and welcome to my family home in India. Come on in. Hi, I'm Allison Kenworthy, the founder of Homeworthy, and we're now offering a membership plan that gives our supporters early and exclusive access to new videos. Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Roz. You're here at my home in Los Angeles. Come on in, I can't wait to show you around. With this membership, we invite you to open more doors, discovering new homes, rooms, and personalities available only to those with the keys to our guest house. You'll be part of a community of people who are just as passionate as you are about interior design. To access all of this exclusive content, simply click the Join button below to become a member today. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Hello, I'm Peter Doskoli, um, uh, a New York designer, and I've lived in India with my wife and daughters for many years. So we're sitting in our home in Delhi. I always, ever since I was a young boy, have been uh, um, very attracted to color, graphics, uh, and ever since I can remember, I've been drawing and painting. And really it was my love for art that led me to study textile design. I sort of stumbled into the fashion world just through my uh, love of graphics and color. I studied textile design at the Fashion Institute of Technology in Manhattan, and um, then in the summer before my senior year, I had a job with a menswear designer and they sent me to Delhi. So that was my first trip uh, 40 years ago. I was 20 years old and on that trip, of course, it was an exciting adventure. Um, I was just uh, uh, struck by the art and the beauty of this ancient civilization. Um, it was on that trip that I met some officials uh, working for the Indian government in the Ministry of Textiles. Um, and I later learned that textiles and handicrafts, handmade textiles, are hugely important in India because there are literally millions and tens of millions, um, uh, perhaps hundreds of millions of people who get their livelihood from uh, artisanal fabrics. Um, so I was invited by the government. They said, go back to New York, finish your uh, last year at FIT, and then come and work for us. So I did that, um, and I ended up working for two years for the Indian government, which was my very first job. Uh, and I've never recovered from the shock and awe of the beauty of this amazing uh, civilization. Here we are in what we can call the atrium of the house. It's a double height space with a skylight at the top and uh, you can see these um, panels that line the upper wall. It's printed linen that's been hand embroidered and we design these in uh, our workshops here in India. I love the idea of living in a, in a cabinet of curiosity filled with um, mementos, memorabilia, uh, natural history items, uh, of course also family uh, uh, pictures, lots of books, um, so we can see artifacts all around the house. Let's walk to the living room now. In the living room, of course, you see this very strong color on the wall. India is all about color, um, and uh, I think covering the wall with so much art, it's nice to have a strong uh, uh, background. All of the art here, it's a little bit high-low. There's nothing very precious, uh, and really they're mementos and memorabilia that uh, our family has collected from all around the world. Uh, there are a lot of tiles from Turkey, from Italy, 
uh, from the south of Spain, um, even from China and uh, Amalfi, where my family comes from in Italy. Also on the wall, as I said, it's a mix of uh, a variety of things. We have some artwork from the children. So my daughter painted this camel, uh, of course, living in India, lots of camels. Uh, there are some miniatures of uh, Mughal engravings that are hand colored, um, a gouache from the Bay of Naples near where my family set sail for the New World of New York. Um, so it's a very rich, here's some uh, painted porcelain tiles from China that I found in Shanghai. Um, some antique French chintz fabric, of course, with our work in textiles, we're always working with antique fabrics. The banquettes are uh, covered in uh, velvet. And then we have um, uh, this furniture from our upholstered furniture collection that we hand make here in India. And it's printed linen. And the print, as you can see, it's inspired by the amazing Kashmiri shawls that come, the paisley shawls of uh, the Valley of Kashmir. Um, so uh, the Mughals loved florals and loved uh, rendering and weaving and printing floral motifs, often very stylized. Here on this uh, sofa, we have um, uh, a paisley shawl, a Jamava shawl, um, and it was a gift from a friend. And um, it, it adds to this sort of maximalist um, mix of patterns, of colors, um, uh, of just sort of surrounding ourselves with the things that we love. This coffee table I found uh, on the 26th Street flea market in Manhattan. There were a number of years where um, uh, this parking lot on 6th Avenue and 26th Street was filled with dealers um, and there were treasures coming from China. So this table, as you can see, the, the drawers go on both sides. Um, and it's this beautiful coffee table um, uh, lacquered with some uh, nice uh, details on the, on the drawers. The fabric on the windows is printed linen, uh, again from our studio. And there are some antique textiles. Uh, a very traditional treatment in decoration in India are shamyanas, or tents. So you can see this um, interesting fabrics tenting the ceilings. Um, uh, we are often inspired by traditional textiles. And in India, once again, the inspiration from Kashmiri shawls and Kashmiri um, hand papered a paper, uh, hand-painted paper mache. One of the, the challenges, or we can say the art of uh, being a maximalist is knowing how to um, create a, a melange or a mix of many different textures, colors, and patterns, and still have it work. Um, and that's the art, that's the trick. Um, you can make mistakes and things can clash. Sometimes clashing is nice, but, um, and it's hard to say um, how to do it. It's something that, uh, that maybe it's instinctual or cultivated, uh, but uh, everything has a harmony. It holds together um, as a complete look but it really is quite a, a broad range of uh, influences. Again, part of the mix of uh, objects and patterns, uh, we can see here a bunch of Chinese figures. Um, when I was traveling constantly all around the world to source fabrics, uh, I found some interesting things in China. And of course, one of the inspirations is really this centuries old, even millennium old uh, tradition of the Silk Route and this mixing of cultures that happened all the way from Japan and China straight through Central Asia, India being a huge part of that, and then ending in the Levant in um, Aleppo and in pr present day Syria right up through Turkey uh, to Europe. And much of our 
European idea of decoration comes from an amalgam of all of these influences. So we have uh, China uh, playing a strong part in uh, my idea of decoration. Of course, we know the style of chinoiserie, which is a European sort of fantasy and idea of what the exotic East is. Uh, and that's part of what, uh, what we enjoy recreating here in our home. Also on the table are these two glass lamps that I found in um, a flea market in East Hampton, out on Long Island. And the shades, these red shades, were made at Gracious Homes, which is a, a big uh, uh, decoration store on the Upper East Side. So being so far away from home, um, these are sort of links back to, uh, you know, if we do start to feel homesick, uh, where we come from. Um, the peacock feathers, uh, part of the richness of the natural uh, biodiversity in India, we have at Lal Koti uh, wild peacocks. We hear them uh, singing at night or uh, as the sun rises and sets. And these feathers are feathers that we've found in the yard and collected over the years. And now if we walk over to this side of the living room, we can see, uh, again, more tiles. Uh, these I found in, uh, in an antique shop in Shanghai. Uh, there are also many uh, sort of grand tour uh, photographs from the late 19th and then the early 20th century of Italy, hand colored. Here you can see this is a fascinating object. It's a fly whisk, a traditional fly whisk uh, uh, we found in Calcutta last Christmas, and it's made of horse hair, uh, and this would traditionally have been used to keep the flies away. Uh, the bar, uh, if we get homesick, here's a, a painting of the Adirondack Mountains, and it's interesting in India, of course, entertaining, especially in North India, uh, uh, people love to party, they love to be social, and uh, we see some social changes happening in the culture. The older generation has grown up drinking a lot of whiskey, and um, I guess not unlike in the U.S., and the younger generation now, there's the whole world of wine opening up. There are winemakers in India, and uh, wine and beer for the younger generation is... Uh, is often had. Some tribal paintings, uh, the whirly uh, paintings of India. Every room in India uh, needs to have uh, air conditioning and it's always sort of unsightly. Most of the homes don't have central heating or air conditioning. So we have what are called splits. They're units that stuck, stick on the wall. And here we've created these um, what are called jali patterns. They're traditional Islamic, uh, and this is a cut wood, pierced wood uh, screen that we've uh, created to mask that, uh, that unsightly air conditioning. Lal Koti is the name of this home, and a koti is a small house um, in Hindi, and lal means red, so it's really the red house. And it's made of red sandstone, which is a very famous stone uh, for building in North India. Um, there's the famous red fort, the Jama Masjid the, the, in the old city. Um, so red sandstone, but the actual architecture is uh, very modern. Uh, it's by a member of this uh, very large extended royal family. Um, and he's a, a practicing architect in Holland. He's a Dutch architect. Um, so the house was created um, uh, in the 1980s. It was built and it's a very interesting use of the earth. Uh, they move it around, they create um, uh, uh, depressions and hills uh, so that the front door is on the ground level, but it's raised and then you come down some steps and you're again on the ground level um, on this uh, back side of the house. And um, there's a beautiful fountain in, in the, the garden uh, that's... Um, part of the family's heritage, and the fountain comes from a palace in the Punjab. So it's a, it's a heritage piece, um, uh, probably from the 19th century, 
and uh, it's bubbling away in the front garden. And uh, that again is a is a uh, it's bringing back this rich history of the art and culture of India. So uh, the Red House Lal Koti um, uh, as a farmhouse here in Delhi. I think. Uh, mentally, life can be hard, and when our surroundings comfort us or reinforce certain values, um, I, I really believe that inanimate objects can do that. So uh, the home we see here is really filled with objects that have meaning for us and, and comfort us daily. And perhaps we can uh, proceed to the dining room which is set for dinner. You know, I think it was Diana Vreeland who's talked about hot pink being the navy blue of India. So uh, we thought to have uh, a pink dining room, uh, but it's not just straight pink, it's really pink mixing with red. Here you can see these dramatic tree of life panels that we've printed uh, at our workshop here in India. Um, and the table uh, laid for dinner. Dishes are, are interesting. They're spowed, and it's a reproduction of uh, an earlier spowed pattern, which was, um, which was made in the 19th century. Of course, the table linens come from Daskali, our, uh, our brand. Um, the richness of Indian craft, the um, embroidery, uh, the block printing, uh, hand weaving, uh, is what brought us originally to India, and it animates the fabrics that we create. Uh, and here again we see on the ceiling the shamyana, that, uh, that tented treatment. And so all of these patterns are um, inspired by traditional Indian textiles. Delhi being the capital uh, of India, uh, all of the embassies are here, and we end up becoming friends with many um, ambassadors and people who work in the, uh, in the embassies. So a typical dinner party could uh, feature uh, close Indian friends, uh, some ambassadors, some people from the UN, maybe UNESCO, which uh, we work with UNESCO with our textile revival work. And um, maybe from the kitchen, we might decide to uh, serve either traditional Indian food um, with chapatis, the, the hot bread, uh, with curries. Um, of course, when entertaining in India, you always have to know your guests or at least ask them before they come if there are any dietary restrictions. So many people in India are uh, vegetarians, and even there, there can be strict vegetarians without even garlic or onions. Um, so it can be complicated. Um, and. Uh, uh, so what you're serving, uh, and it can be quite diverse. We also love serving um, Italian food, pastas, um, and, Indi and that's always a good solution for vegetarians as well. You can make great vegetable pastas. Um, so uh, we, uh, and serving, having a sit-down dinner is often a challenge in Delhi because people are, uh, they're unruly, they do what they want. They come and they go, they'll come late, they'll leave, maybe they have two other parties to go to in the evening. So you have to know your guests, and if you're planning a sit-down dinner, uh, the people, uh, your guests need to know that it's a sit-down dinner that's timed. Um, also, a little bit like Spain, uh, in North India, in Delhi, people eat very late. Uh, also, another interesting sort of thing that happens is at a party, you'll arrive at a party, you'll have amazing snacks, that what, what are called snacks, but they're hot foods, um, oftentimes veg, non-veg, um, while you're drinking, and it can go on for two or three hours of people socializing, nibbling, having finger foods. And then, towards the end of the evening, the host will serve dinner and then people eat and they say goodbye and go home, which is sort of a, a funny thing for me to have experienced and learned about. And dinner gets served so late that I ended up, my wife and I ended up 
we would eat before we would go out. So, and then I could never resist the delicious food that served at like 11 o'clock at night. So I would end up having two dinners every time we would go out. But, um, so those are some of the interesting things you learn about that are the cultural differences when you live in a, in a different culture. When I uh, came as a young man to work for the Indian government, it was at a moment when uh, the government of India was projecting its culture and we can say soft power through a series of major museum exhibitions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, at the Cooper Hewitt and the Smithsonian uh, in Manhattan, in Washington, at the Louvre in Paris, uh, at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and other museums also in St. Petersburg. It was called the Festival of India, and uh, many uh, curators and um, uh, designers were enlisted to work on uh, craft development for these exhibitions, and that's the world that I fell into. All those years ago, when I first came to India, uh, I had the great good fortune of working with uh, someone who uh, was one of the major craft revivalists and uh, people working with handmade textiles. His name was Martin Singh, and he was a prince from the royal house of Kaputala in Punjab. And this family, uh, that uh, of whom I, uh, my family and I stay in this house, Lal Koti, belongs to that family. Um, and so there's a wonderful connection there with me personally, uh, with someone who I consider like my guru. And uh, this house is a farmhouse in South Delhi. And uh, anyone who knows India knows that it can be very intense. Um, it's a, it can be a very crowded place. The population is huge. And Delhi, I think, is a city with 27 million people in the whole metro area. So it's a very intense place to live. And living here at Lal Koti, it's like a sanctuary and a bit of um, countryside within the city of Delhi. So we have a wonderful garden, we have a great swimming pool, uh, and we have a mango orchard in the back of the house. Um, and that's uh, how we, uh, we came to uh, be in this house, through these uh, long-standing connections with this family. And now let's go to the TV room. All good American households have to have a TV room. <laughs> and ours is a, a little bit special being here in India. Of course, we love color. And here another strong uh, yellow color on the walls. Once again, in keeping with that sort of maximalist theme, uh, a little bit calmer here. Um, we have a couple of nature studies, paintings of birds uh, that a dear friend made, um, some oriental decoration, these Chinese panels uh, hanging on either side. Of course, symmetry is very important to me as a designer, uh, the television, of course, and then this amazing tonka we found in Nepal, in Kathmandu. And uh, it has the, uh, I think, 367 images of Buddha. Uh, and it's linked, that no I think that's the number, and the number is linked with some uh, mystical belief in that faith. Um, and that's pretty much it here. More family photos. Um, the textiles on the sofa are interesting. It's, uh, once again, from our studio. Uh, hand-printed uh, silk satin on these bolsters um, with uh, a chenille velvet and a printed linen with some uh, velvet stripe. The flowers come from the local flower market, which would be an, another interesting tour for us to make. Uh, it's the wholesale market. We go very early in the morning and um, it's quite a scene. It's a, a big bustling place, uh, and they're selling both um, uh, cut flowers the way we know them uh, for people to use in their homes, but that's really the smaller part of, uh, of what the market is selling. Uh, they're also selling marigold and other 
uh, lotus flowers and significant flowers that are tied to worship and the temples and offerings made to the deities. So it's always uh, a very interesting place to visit. And as we head to the uh, downstairs guest bedroom, we're passing through the, this sort of entrance uh, area uh, with these cabinets uh, that are upholstered in printed cotton from our office and this beautiful Bessarabian carpet on the floor. Bessarabians are from Eastern Europe and it's a flat weave, so it's like a kilim weave. And they're always uh, characterized by having large uh, floral motifs. So we're in the downstairs uh, guest room and as you can see again some artwork on the walls. These are some original drawings from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the uh, architecture school in Paris. Another gouache of the Bay of Naples, uh, those architectural renderings. And then we see more of those 19th century Grand Tour photographs, this time of Venice, hand-colored uh, in some very beautiful frames. And then here uh, along this wall above the headboards are a series of uh, watercolor illustrations that I had done after I met uh, Cecile. And we have an interesting story. We met in India. Uh, we were both here on business trips. Cecile's family was also in textiles. And uh, we met in Delhi, a, a friend introduced us. And the very next day after meeting, we went, uh, Cecile had booked and was scheduled to go alone to Agra to visit the Taj Mahal. And I canceled my meetings for that day and we went together. And uh, the driver thought we were on our honeymoon because it's such a typical destination for, uh, for newlyweds. And that's how sort of we, we had a very intense meeting, just two days, and then Cecile flew back to Paris. Um, shortly after that, she came to visit me in New York. Uh, I tried to dazzle her with the beauty of Manhattan. We went to the, the Rainbow Room in Rockefeller Center so that I could show her all of Manhattan uh, over martinis. And uh, then I went to visit her in Paris and she brought me to a party with her friends and they, everyone was coming up to me saying, uh, ah, you're that Indian guy. Because all they knew was that Cecile had gone to India and met some guy. So I'm that Indian guy. And, um, and, then, and then the rest is history. We, we embarked upon a year of uh, what I call living dangerously. We would meet in exotic locales in Como, in Italy, in Marrakesh. And it was quite an intense year. Uh, and then we were married. And I jokingly say, Cecile married me thinking she was getting Manhattan. And she got Delhi. Because uh, then my plans changed with work. And she agreed. She loves India. And uh, of course, that's now old history and, and uh, happily ever after and all of that. <laughs> the watercolors are, uh, it's a bit of a story. And uh, actually, um, Cecile already had uh, a daughter, Clara, and this was my, uh, and she was only four years old. And this was uh, actually a story to Clara, explaining how uh, her mother and I had met. We shifted to this house in the first lockdown during COVID. And um, living here, it's really the peace and quiet. Um, uh, India is a remarkable place for nature. It has, it's one of the richest countries in the world for biodiversity. And um, the birds that are at this home, uh, we have wild peacocks that, that we hear in the night, uh, in the morning, at dawn. Uh, the birds are really astonishing. There's a lot of fruit trees. So even though we're in the city of Delhi, it's the nature um, and the peace and the quiet that, uh, that we most love. It's, uh, it's like a little sanctuary in the city. My wife and I, despite the fact that I'm a, an American from New York, uh, I've been abroad for so many years. Uh, and my family is of Italian origins. And my wife's family also is very Mediterranean. She's French and uh, her family also comes from Istanbul. 
uh, Turkey and uh, being European and Mediterranean uh, is very much a part of our identity. So um, living in this home, uh, it's really the accumulation of objects over our uh, lifetimes. And uh, each object sort of tells a story about a place, about a moment in time. And um, uh, you know, this arc of uh, education in any individual life is something that's very important if you're curious if you're always learning and for my for me and my life i wasn't really born with a huge exposure to aesthetics and art and it's something that i really had to learn over many years so it's my studies in uh, decorative arts uh, in european art and in the arts of uh, many diverse cultures from all over the world that informs the decoration of this house. I mean, I, I'm a designer and I design textiles and products for interior decoration and fashion. So uh, it sort of makes sense that uh, the, the, our home would uh, be a manifestation of those aesthetics that, uh, that we love as, an, as a family and that are important to me. I think there are a few um, important um, uh, inspirations in my life aesthetically. Um, uh, there are a couple of major designers. Renzo Mangiardino was an Italian uh, set designer, uh, costume designer, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, created amazing ambiances and interiors for his clients. And then a woman in Paris named Madeleine Castin. So these were two huge influences on, uh, on me aesthetically and uh, sort of we can see traces of, of their style in this house. And then of course one tries to develop one's own point of view. So really it's the artifacts and I believe that you know, uh, creating a home, you should have things that are familiar and meaningful to you. Even if you're working with a professional designer, um, I think it's important to have that communication back and forth. And a good designer is going to create uh, an environment for you that, uh, that touches you personally. Shall we go and explore upstairs? On the stairs leading to the mezzanine section, we have uh, some artifacts here. Uh, this beloved one of my heroes is TR, Theodore Roosevelt, and his uh, philosophy of life and uh, engaging and a life of doing and action. So that's a bronze I found again out in a, in, in a junk shop in East Hampton. Uh, these are some Chinese funeral uh, stone uh, sculptures. And then again, this idea of uh, things that are new but uh, are reproductions. This is the head of a Roman boy from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And then this uh, is a very heavy marble head of Alexander the Great that we found in uh, the Archaeological Museum in Istanbul and lugged it all the way back. Uh, then here are three panels, uh, printed uh, raw silk, handwoven, with some hand embroidery in, of course, a, a, a Greek theme. And in our work, uh, we're always using antique documents, history, and books are very important. So there's a small library here of reference books. Uh, books on interiors, books on all the major uh, textile collections in the Victoria and Albert, the, uh, the Museum of Decorative Arts uh, in Paris, and uh, a variety of inspirations. On the floor, we have an interesting Samarkand carpet uh, from Central Asia. And this, you can see, it looks very uh, oriental. Uh, and the chairs are covered in uh, a jacquard uh, that I did many years ago uh, when I was in New York. It's woven in Como in Italy. So here we are in the mezzanine uh, above that uh, uh, double height atrium area with the embroidered panels uh, surrounding. And this is the master bedroom. Let's have a look. 
And for the master bedroom, the idea was to create like a cocoon wrapped in fabric. As you can see, the idea, which is, which is a traditional uh, French decorative treatment, is to take one fabric and cover all the walls, sometimes even the ceiling. Here, the ceiling is not covered. Uh, but you can see we took this uh, very complex striped fabric that we created in the studio um, and uh, covered the walls. We put this um, little uh, molding around uh, at the ceiling level, just below. Uh, we printed that uh, engineered border to follow that wood, and then beneath it, we draped the fabric. So uh, it creates a wonderfully warm feeling uh, that you really feel like you're, uh, I mean, it's a fairly big room, but you sort of feel like you're in a, in a boat or in a tent uh, with um, all of the fabric surrounding you. Um, and it's a mix of um, Indian-inspired, but also European, with the classic florals, uh, the very realistic floral stripe, mixing with that very small uh, stripe, and then with this paisley uh, print. Obviously, taste is completely up to the individual, and some people are devoted to minimalism, uh, and I, I get it, I understand that aesthetic. Uh, it's pure simplicity, and you can say that it reflects uh, your mind also, a simplicity of mind or spirit. I love the excitement of decoration, of pattern, and for me, I'd rather be in a stimulating environment with interesting shapes and forms and colors rather than a simply bare space. But I understand it, I get it, and I can get into simplicity as well. Of course, with simplicity, the bones of the space become even more important. So maybe if you have some monumental architecture or the integrity of the raw materials, whether it's stone or wood, then uh, minimalism is possible here with maximalism or with lots of things happening decoratively, it can cover a lot of uh, shortcomings in a space. And there are many shortcomings in this home. But that's, so those are my feelings about simplicity, minimalism, and maximalism. But in the end, I love uh, the excitement of uh, the association also of motifs. Um, it's like a trigger of history for the imagination. I love history, I love reading history. And uh, for me, the history of decorative arts, of civilization itself, of how humans have created over the, the thousands of years, layers of culture, uh, for me, that's interesting. And that's why I, I love India so much and um, why my work with decorative arts and textiles keeps me um, enthused because it's always a discovery. Um, and I'm not the type of designer that's trying to create something that you look at it and you think, I've never seen that before. I love the idea of the links with history and uh, uh, progression and uh, an incremental change. I guess I'm sort of conservative in that way. An interesting anecdote about this rug is uh, I was working in Manhattan, uh, right on Madison Square Park on 26th Street, and I left the office um, to uh, go for lunch, I think, and there was a man standing on the sidewalk uh, looking a little nervous, and he had rolled up a carpet, and I did a double take because I'm always interested in carpets, and he asked me if I wanted to buy the carpet. And I said, no, you know, someone in New York City, you, you don't want to really engage. And then he said, uh, just $200. And I said, I, I would love to. He showed it to me. It looked very beautiful. And I said, I, I don't have $200. He said, there's an ATM right there. So I went and got it and I bought it. And then years later, I brought it to be cleaned. Uh, this is the carpet uh, here in India with three other Afghani carpets. And the dealer who was doing the cleaning for me asked if I would sell this. And he said, it's a, it's a, 
a, a special carpet. So I was very pleased about that. And I always wondered about that man, who he was, why he needed the money uh, so badly. Um, and that's the anecdote about this carpet. Uh, these stools are covered in a beautiful um, uh, silk satin uh, that's dyed red and then it's hand embroidered. So the fineness of this embroidery is quite remarkable. And it's a nice accent to, uh, to the blue bed and the canopies. So here we are in the front garden at Lal Koti. And uh, really, this is Rani Saab's property. It's her garden. She's planted all of these amazing trees. We have fruit trees, uh, a mango orchard in the back, which uh, we'll see in a little bit. Um, and this fountain from one of the palaces of the family in, uh, in Punjab. And uh, it's just a delight to be here. It's like a sanctuary in the in tenth city of New Delhi. So we have a great variety of trees and we have uh, gardeners who take care of it. As you can see, the maintenance is, uh, is quite strenuous. And um, uh, well, some of them are flowers, some of them are fruit trees, these exotic palm trees. Uh, for me, it's just a delight. The birds that come and sing, we have the wild peacocks. Uh, and this glorious fountain. Uh, sometimes we entertain, we set tables on the lawn. Of course, in winter, it's uh, an amazing uh, place to sit in the sun. Um, and this remarkable house. Uh, the house is made of the very traditional material of red sandstone, which in North India, many of the monuments are made, uh, the great forts uh, and tombs of the Mughals, certainly. Uh, of course, um, uh, the Taj Mahal is white marble, but other than that, um, uh, red sandstone really is used quite a bit. And this depression, it's almost like an amphitheater, as you can see with steps on, uh, either, on three sides, the front, uh, which is the north, the west, and the uh, east. Um, so, this is the front yard of Lal Koti. It's a sanctuary here. We have that front garden with the fountain, the house, uh, a swimming pool behind this hedge, and then what's like a remarkable country road in the city of New Delhi, and a mango orchard on the other side of this hedge. Uh, sometimes we can set a table amidst the trees and uh, have lunch, so let's go check that out. So here we are at the mango orchard at Lal Koti. I always think it's a little bit like an enchanted uh, garden and uh, in the heat of the day to be beneath the trees, this cluster of fruit trees here, uh, we have a, a, a table set for lunch. Uh, it's just a fantasy. You know, mangoes in India hold a very special place in the culture. I think there's something like 32 uh, different varieties. And uh, growing up on Long Island in New York, we don't know anything about mangoes. Here, there are the specialists, uh, both the growers and the consumers. Um, some mangoes are soft and juicy and sweet, and some are uh, firm and sour and katak. And um, sometimes they're cooked. Uh, a lot of times they're eaten uh, raw. And uh, it's fascinating. Once I was at a dinner at a friend's home in Gujarat, and they served this amazing mango puree and it was just this light fluffy orange uh, delight. Um, so here we are in the mango orchard. The table is set with one of our new uh, table linen collections. Um, the tablecloth, of course, this is a chinoiserie theme based on the Orient and China. Um, the tablecloth is printed linen, uh, a design made of pagodas and uh, different cherry blossoms. Uh, the placemats are a traditional in, uh, 
Chinese um, geometric pattern and we have some hand embroidery. Of course, the crafts of India are uh, super famous and quite diverse. And these are hand embroidered with these knots creating the center of the flowers. And this napkin, all of our napkins, and in fact, our cotton dresses are made of hand spun, hand woven cotton. And it's remarkable. I call them uh, like a, a cultural artifact because this cotton is grown on small family farms in India. And then the plant is spun by hand and then woven by hand. So it's really like a pre-industrial agrarian uh, ecosystem that these products come out of. And I'm always talking about the sustainability of Indian craft and how much India can offer the world regarding uh, the fashion industry. The dishes are Wedgwood and it's another story behind these. Uh, it's a pattern that when Napoleon was defeated by Britain and exiled to the island of St. Helena, uh, he ate from these Wedgwood uh, plates of this pattern. So this is called Napoleon Ivy. Uh, Ivy. Uh, and it's quite a sort of historic um, setting. And uh, here we are in the mango orchard. What does home mean to me? Uh, you know, my parents, uh, my grandparents left southern Italy and came to New York. It's that classic immigrant story uh, being processed through Ellis Island and settling in Brooklyn. My wife's family are Sephardic Jews who, of course, 500 years ago left Spain and uh, were welcomed by the Sultan of uh, the Ottoman Empire in Istanbul. So we're very Mediterranean, but we're also used to, um, uh, at least our genetics and our family, uh, are used to um, traveling and uh, whether it's for economic reasons or political reasons, um, uh, making a home in a place that is uh, not necessarily your community's home or uh, uh, an environment that you've been in for generations. Um, and we've taken some of that sensibility with us here, uh, settling and living for so many years in India. Um, firstly, I think to do that, you have to be uh, somewhat secure with your own identity. Um, uh, as, as, uh, as an individual and standing, uh, it takes some strength uh, to remain who you are, but it also requires, I think, uh, a love for humanity and for people uh, and a curiosity to learn. So it's not very easy uh, as a foreigner to live in India. As I said, it's such a, a different culture. And yet our friends that we have here um, we've experienced love, uh, friendship, um, uh, uh, life and the birth of loved ones, the death of loved ones. And this is so it's this human experience. Um, uh, how do we do it? I think we're very much at home in India and that requires a certain amount of, um, I think, mental flexibility, psychological uh, maturity, uh, and also a uh, love for people uh, and differences. You know, um, when I first came to India, I, it was an adventure, I was excited to be here, and it wasn't until years later that I realized that some people, uh, they come to India and they hate it. That surprised me because the whole idea of wanting to stay where you are in the world that you know, I understand the appeal of that, but to not be curious, to not be open to things, the mystery of life outside of what you know uh, is something that astonishes me. And I think that's what um, home for me really ends up being um, where I am and where, of course, my loved ones are, where my family is. But I want to be open. I want to experience the unknown. Um, I'm comforted by those things that are familiar to me, but the idea of adventure. So where is home? Home uh, for me and for my family, I think, is wherever we happen to be. So New York, 
will always be home. Uh, uh, I love America, uh, my wife, and now I'm very much European and uh, my wife's family is in Paris and home for us is Paris. We have a beautiful home in Bordeaux uh, and India. We, uh, our loved ones are here, our close friends are here. Um, and I think really that says something about uh, the age that we live in with communications being so easy uh, that home ends up being um, uh, really someplace inside. Um, uh, you know, there's that amazing uh, quote um, that says something about if you would travel to the Indies to discover the wealth of the Indies, you must bring it with you. And I think that's, uh, that's something very important. I think home for me is something uh, internal, it's interior. Um, uh, with family, but uh, it's something that you, you carry with you. Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.